Chapter 8. Beware, or Great Expositions The Doctor and Romana dashed out of the door to Visegrad Castle's ancient Cairoan exhibition room, turning down the corridor beyond and heading for the nearest stairs. They were hotly pursued by a werewolf, werefox, and taking the lead, a werebear. Their most ursine of pursuers had until a minute earlier been Arcos, steward of Dr. Nugati's residential staff. The other creatures chasing the Time Lords had also, until recently, been members of the castle household. As the two Time Lords descended the stairs deeper into the fortress, it was not just the beasts behind them they had to worry about. How big do you think Nugati's staff actually is? Romana asked, a little breathily as she ran. The doctor shrugged as he pelted down the stairs. As he did so, his halberd got stuck between the wall and the steps. For haste's sake, he simply abandoned it there as a potential barrier or trip hazard for those behind. I am hoping he was somewhat niggardly when it comes to housekeeping. That said, it is likely there is at least a cook, possibly other kitchen or serving staff. Hopefully we can outrun them all. Just before they reached the grand staircase which led down to the main entrance hall, a wolf with a strange purplish scar over its left eye leapt out in front of them. It growled ferociously, its hackles rising. Romana clubbed it hard with a backhand swing of the pommel of her sword stick connecting just above the right eye. The stuffed wolf tumbled away down the steps, spinning and rolling like a rag doll. I had forgotten about our taxidermy troubles, Romana said, frowning. Do you think they'll have dispersed a little since we last saw them? The doctor shrugged uncertainly. It's at times like these I wish we'd bought K-9 with us. His nose laser can come in rather handy in tough spots like this. Too many stairs, Romana said flatly. Nonsense, the doctor responded, offended on K-9's behalf. He has come a long way since those days, figuratively and literally. You know very well he is the stairmaster now. Romana shrugged. It's moot anyway. He's currently inside the TARDIS, somewhere in Buddha Aerodrome. The doctor sighed, nodding sadly. You are right, of course. Ah well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. With that, he leapt to the top of the stairs. Romana was but a step behind him. Close by, at the end of the landing they were still on, they could hear clattering, snapping, howling and growling as the temporary barrier installed by the doctor was unceremoniously dealt with by the werebeasts. The doctor and Romana had no choice but to run down the stairs and face whatever remained in the entrance hall. Fortunately, there were far fewer animated hunting trophies on display than when they had first fled the place with the help of Akosh, the steward. Obviously, all the mounted heads were still there, screeching and biting at them, but as long as they steered clear of the walls, the Time Lords were safe enough. Unfortunately, there were still one or two more mobile hunting victims on the prowl. A lynx padded up towards the doctor, who saw it off with a well-placed kick to its side. The now doubly scarred wolf had recovered its footing at the bottom of the stairs. Romana raised her stick with the deepest of scowls, and in the firmest of voices repeated her earlier assessment of its character. Bad wolf! It did not advance any further. In fact, it looked a little woozy. Romana raised the index finger of the hand, not brandishing the sword cane. Sit! she ordered shrilly. Much to her and the doctor's surprise, it did just that. They ran now through the room, avoiding or fending off the few remaining creatures they encountered until they reached the huge double doors of the castle itself. The doctor began to draw back the bolts securing it, while Romana stood at his back, threatening all comers with her makeshift club. Just as the doctor finished this task, he heard a growl coming from a side door away to his right. Both he and Romana glanced over to see what new danger had arisen. Standing in a doorway, barely able to fit through, 
was a figure well over seven feet tall. The clothes on its upper body were all but gone, all save a tall white hat perched upon its furry head. The modesty of the thing's lower half was partly preserved by a torn ankle-length skirt and a white apron over that. The face was distinctly porcine, tusks and all. The castle cook had clearly become a werebore. The doctor threw open one of the double doors, placing it between the two time lords and the newest were-creature. As he did so, the trio of werebeasts from the exhibition room appeared at the top of the main staircase and began to barrel down it. Quick, Romana, run! The doctor ordered, half dragging her through the newly made exit. Once through, he slammed the door behind them, though he knew without the means to lock it from outside it would prove a poor obstacle at best. As they ran across the drawbridge of the suspended fortress to gain the outside stairs to ground level, Romana turned to the doctor. Given how scared the villagers were, I have no doubt the werebeasts will pursue us. But do you think Nugati's reanimated menagerie will also leave the castle? The doctor shrugged again as they jogged down the stairs. Let's just hope they're house-trained, he responded. Romana rolled her eyes. As they ran, they heard a thump from above them, the castle doors being thrown open. Sometimes I wonder if I'm getting too old for this, he muttered. Romana frowned at him. Which reminds me of something you said earlier, and let me be the first to say, nonsense, she began. You've only just regenerated, more or less, and that is something else I intend to come back to at some later date. What I really wanted to say right now is you must stop all this. I'm over two billion years old rubbish. The doctor frowned back at her. Need I remind you that I went to Gallifrey the... He began, but was interrupted by Romana. The long way round. Yes, yes, all very impressive. And billions, trillions of you, all sacrificed themselves in order for you to get to Gallifrey. All very brave and speaks to your character, but you are glossing over one very important point. One of them lived, went through it once without dying. You. Your life in the confession dial was a matter of days at most, possibly only hours. Granted, you've been around a while, and no doubt you have two or three millennia behind you, but two billion years? As I said, nonsense. While she said this with a remonstrative tone, a smile did play around the corners of her mouth. The doctor harumphed in reply as they reached the bottom of the stairs. That final blow did really hurt my knuckles, he grumbled to himself. They now stared around Visegrad Village Square. Although well and truly night by now, the triple moons of Hung Area were keeping things surprisingly well illuminated. As if in response to these staring orbs, an eerie howl came from one of their pursuers near the top of the stairs to the castle. Given the warm reception they gave us before we entered the castle, Romana began, and released the curse, the doctor interjected. Precisely, Romana continued, nodding. I think it unlikely we'll find any aid or shelter here. The doctor nodded. We had best make for the next village. I remember we passed one a couple of miles back in the cabbie on the way here. Do you think we can outrun these creatures on the open road? Romana asked. Not a chance, the doctor replied, shaking his head. It was a winding road. To be on it would be to be needlessly exposed and for far too long. However, if we cut due south through the woods, we shall both save time and gain a little cover. Romana nodded and they dashed through the village, hoping to put as much distance between them and the castle as possible. Are you sure we're heading south? Romana mused. The doctor sighed. From the position of the road relative to the village, coupled with my memories of its route here and my knowledge of Hungarian astronomical data, the triple moons, for example, I am fairly confident we're heading in the right direction. Romana raised an eyebrow. Fairly confident? I'm overwhelmed. Now they were running through the trees. Although a dense forest, there was enough space between the trunks to give them fairly easy passage. This was even more true when they reached the odd ironroot tree on their travels. The overbearing shade from these black and russet goliaths, discouraging any other lesser trees from growing too close. Unfortunately, easy as the going was for them, it was just as clear for their pursuers. The doctor and Romana could hear them crashing through the undergrowth behind them. Clearly they were not bothering to be stealthy. They were also clearly gaining. These claims as to the werebeast's lack of stealth proved to be too sweeping. The werefox appeared in front of them, snarling, its clawed hands raised. 
Romana drew her sword stick. No, the doctor cried at her in a desperate panic. He then leapt at the were fox. The doctor grappled with the vulpine beast but was clearly outmatched. Romana, try and knock it out, the doctor yelled as he and the creature rolled on the ground locked in a deadly embrace. The snapping and unusually large fangs of the fox grew steadily closer to the doctor's exposed neck. With a reluctant sigh, Romana sheathed her weapon and reversed it, as she had done when facing Dr. Nugati's revived trophies. Then she stepped into the fray. Hopping around the tumbling bodies of the doctor and the were-fox, Romana found she was unable to get a clear shot. Roll onto your back, Romana cried desperately as she stared around looking for an opening. Let it be on top. Whichever position suits you best, my dear, the doctor rasped through his ongoing efforts. He was not even sure how much control he had over the situation, but whether it was his continued attempts to throw his opponent, or his opponent gaining the upper hand, eventually the doctor found himself pinned under the werefox. There was a meaty thump. The unfortunate creature gave a single whimper, then closed its eyes, and was still. The doctor, with a little help from Romana, pushed the body of the beast from him. He knelt down next to it and placed a finger against its neck. Nodding with satisfaction, he then removed it and stood up. Thank goodness for that. Still alive, he told Romana with satisfaction. She shook her head in exasperation. What's so good about that? She asked incredulously. Given its unnatural strength and power, I've no doubt it'll be up and after us again in no time, she continued. Why on Gallifrey didn't you let me kill it? The doctor tutted, shaking his head. Oh, Romana, he began disappointedly. That just wouldn't do at all. These poor creatures are people too, victims no less, the unwilling and unwitting playthings of Nugati. We cannot kill them, we need to save them. Romana frowned at the doctor. Save them? Well, that's all well and good, assuming they give us the opportunity before killing us, and they were part of Nugati's household before they were ever werebeasts, I'd wager. It's a fine line between victim and complicit. The doctor waggled his head impatiently. No matter how loyal they were to Nugati, I doubt any of them willingly volunteered to have this centuries-old curse awakened in them. Akos's reaction to the change alone, and his aiding us earlier, would certainly support this theory. As the doctor finished, they heard another howl coming from nearby. Well, doctor, Romana countered, as they began to run south once more. Do you have some plan for exactly how you hope to aid them? Beyond providing a good meal, I mean. The doctor fell silent and looked deep in thought. So deep, in fact, Romana had to tug him a little to keep him running. Finally, he answered. I'm afraid right now, as it stands, I do not. He was forced to concede. At first it seemed their pursuers were snapping at their very heels. Yet as they ran deeper into the forest, the sound of the hunt started to fade. It looks like we might actually be outdistancing them after all, Romana cried, some hope creeping into her voice. You know, you might be right the doctor agreed cheerfully. Periodically, they could still hear a distant yelp, howl, or growl, but they were definitely becoming more faint. The Time Lords ran on with a new spring in their steps, re-energized by their athletic prowess. The doctor skidded to a halt, grabbing Romana's arm as he did so. Romana, he said slowly, where did that bark come from? Romana cocked her head, thinking for a moment. That last one? Well, if we are facing south, as I am sure we are Given your impeccable sense of direction, I would say to the northeast, behind us. A long lupine howl broke through the moonlit, tree-dappled night. It was obviously some distance away. And that? The doctor asked quietly. Romana frowned. Sounded like west of us. Still some way off. Perhaps they are losing the trail. The doctor made no sound or signal to confirm or deny her supposition, remaining stony-faced. A long, low ursine growl drifted through the forest now. And that? he asked grimly. Romana looked up towards the forest canopy above, mulling over what her senses were telling her. I'd say coming from... southeast of us. The last words were said with mounting trepidation. The doctor nodded confirmation. I don't think they're losing us, he said sadly. I think they're surrounding us. Romana sat down hard on the ground, dejected. Of course they are, she said, sighing. The doctor sat down next to her. Chin up. All is not lost yet, he offered. 
Even to his ears, the optimism sounded a little forced. So what now, Doctor? I have to say, removing the threat of the werefox easily when we had the chance is looking increasingly the more sensible option, she said pointedly. The doctor shook his head. Let us hope we never have to resort to such final solutions. I've never been comfortable assuming that right. Let us instead put our minds to work, he said, with just a touch of irritation. Romana acquiesced with an inclination of her forehead. Yes, there must be some weakness to them. If we look back at Hungarian or Albion law, we might find something, even Earth law. These final words from Romana were made with an increased measure of suspicion versus those which had preceded them. Romana, what is it? the doctor asked. Romana continued to frown as thoughts began to coalesce. Why does the Earth share so much history with the Upsilon Orionis system? No, no, before you interrupt, I don't mean what the people here learned from the Encyclopedia Britannica, no. There are too many coincidences, too many shared myths, which do not fit with the timelines of Earth and Upsilon Orionis. They have a limited, and one way, passage of ideas from one to the other at most. Now it was the doctor's turn to frown. He pursed his lips, clearly anticipating trouble, or at least inconvenience ahead. Go on, what specifically is troubling you? He asked cautiously. Romana huffed and shrugged. Specifically many things. How is it we are currently sitting on a planet called Hungaria being chased by werewolves surrounded by vampire vines? It doesn't match exactly. Granted, Transylvania was part of northern Hungary in the early part of the 20th century, and werewolves on Earth are a little less geographically specific myths, still generally Middle European. But why should Earth's dim and distant ancient myths have any resonances with this planet's far more recent ancient historical reality? They are separated by a couple of hundred thousand years and in the wrong direction. Well, the doctor began slowly. And another thing, Romana butted in over the doctor's rising finger. The ancient gods and monuments of Cairo. They predate the discovery of the encyclopedia by the Cairoan civilization, and yet postdate near identical beliefs in similarly named regions of ancient Earth. Again, separated by hundreds of millennia and as many light years, impossible for any causal connection to exist between the two. Romana was quite confident in her assessment of the problem. She had reached quite a crescendo of conclusiveness. The doctor paused, almost as if to allow the applause to die away. When he was reasonably sure there were no further interruptions imminent, he began to carefully reveal his own thoughts. Romana, dear Romana, need I remind you we are time lords? We do not have such limited and linear conceptions of space, time and causality, he began seriously. Romana raised a finger. We do not. But we, and Gallifrey and society in general, possess time machines. By necessity, we have a more fluid and flexible relationship with space-time. Nevertheless, most of the rest of the universe does not. And it is usually bound by its own rules. The doctor shook his head slowly. Are you sure this is the same universe it has always been? I rather suspect it will never be the same again. Romana frowned at the doctor. Go on, Romana said as serious as the doctor but unable to resist a slight tease. What specifically is bothering it? A single burst of air puffed through the doctor's nose, the slightest of chuckles. However, it did little to break the mood. I broke the universe, he began, then held up a hand to forestall Romana's inevitable interruption. Yes, I know we fixed it, more or less, we hope, barring the persistent damage to this system, of course. But that time, for want of a better word, when the universe was fractured, still occurred. Yes, during that time, each fragment was utterly separate and adrift from each other. You might even suspect there would be fewer connections between the histories of one region of space-time with another. Especially when, as in the case of much of Earth's history, and that of the Upsilon Orionis system, they were largely in completely different fragments, it seems. Romana nodded cautiously. I think I begin to see where you are going, but please don't let me interrupt. The doctor flashed her the briefest of smiles. As you wish, he continued graciously. So separate fragments from this universe's point of view, but not from one very particular perspective. The view of the bulk. The doctor paused for a moment to allow these words to sink in. The entities of the bulk, such as those we encountered before, Breshapep, possibly Great Nogad, and other nameless, infinitely more terrifying monstrosities, had no such barriers of access to any fragment of our universe. 
Indeed, the very concept of barriers in their eleven-dimensional existence is doubtless utterly unknown to them, a meaningless concept, and they potentially touched all of our time and space simultaneously. Here the doctor stopped and grabbed both Romana's forearms. Such was the intensity of the import he felt towards his next words. How do we know that what we think of as history is what we have always thought? Romana shook her head, refusing to accept ideas growing unbidden yet unstoppable within her mind. In spite of her agitation, she did not pull away. We are time lords, she insisted. We are used to the odd shift in the order of events, massaging of the details of history. We would have noticed. The doctor's head waved once more. Would we? On such a scale? At a level so trivial to the bulk entities and their agents, and yet so fundamental to our own four-dimensional bubble of existence and all those who inhabit it? How do we know that previously things were not significantly different to how they are now? Perhaps before Atlantis never existed. Perhaps the Daleks never survived their final tussle with the Thals on Skaro and died, devoid of power in their metallic city. And maybe Clyde never died at all. Lived a long and happy life in Ealing with K-9? These final words came with heavy hearts for the doctor. He looked down and released Romana's arms. Finally he looked up and his tone became more normal, at least by his standards. Who knows whose fingers or tentacles have played with our histories? Satesh or Set? What did Nugati refer to it as? Ikthul too? Perhaps it had as much influence on the ancient Egyptians, the builders of the Sphinx and the pyramids as it did on the ancient Cairoans, separated by eons and megaparsecs to us, but merely two sides of the same coin to such bulk creatures. And who's to say who whispered tales of vampires and werewolves on Earth? Perhaps it was more than whispers. Perhaps some capricious bulk thing transported a few from here to there. Just on a whim, just for a laugh. Or perhaps with no intentions at all. Here the doctor paused and smiled ruefully at Romana. As you have pointed out a few times already, consequences, always consequences, he finished with a shake of his head. They sat in silence for a few seconds. Their reverie was broken by another long and eerie howl. This one sounded a little closer, and from due south. Illuminating as all this undoubtedly is, Romana noted, it seems to have shone little light on our current situation. The doctor stroked his chin. No, no, I think perhaps it has. Having our minds set on other issues may have cleared the wood from the trees, so to speak, for the matter in hand. Tell me, why is this place called Hung Area? Romana frowned at him. This hardly seems like the time to play tour guide, she observed. The doctor shook his head. That is hardly my intention, but on this question perhaps you could indulge me. Romana raised her eyebrows. It's all I ever do, but why break a perfectly good habit now? Okay, why hung area? Because of the ancient custom of suspending their buildings. The doctor nodded. And why did they do that? The doctor asked, waggling his eyebrows a little. To avoid the attacks of savage beasts. Romana's reply had started matter-of-factly, but by the final words her eyes had begun to widen in realization. The doctor smiled. You begin to see what I see, he said encouragingly. So all we need to do is climb a tree to evade these creatures, supposed poor climbers as they are. The doctor waggled his head uncertainly. Perhaps, but it may be worthwhile being a little more precise. None of the suspended buildings we have seen were supported using normal trees or indeed any other means save one. Romana nodded slowly. Ah, you think there is something special about the iron roots, beyond their unusual size and strength, I mean? The doctor agreed. I cannot say for sure, but any advantage we can gain right now would be better than none. So let's hope we come across another iron root tree before our pursuers come across us. With that, the two Time Lords set off south once again, knowing all the while that no direction now offered any safety. The Doctor and Romana felt particularly fortunate when about a minute later they entered what looked like a small clearing. As their eyes adjusted to the deeper gloom, they realized this was far from an empty clearing. Most of the central area was occupied by the vast charcoal grey cylinder of an iron root trunk. Its expansive canopy, stretching out high above that of the surrounding forest, had completely blocked the moons from view. This was why the trunk had been so hard to spot. Around that same trunk curled a vampire vine, 
its central tendril rooted in the soil just like the iron root it was attached to. As it curved up and around the pillar of the trunk, it almost formed a spiral staircase, or at least ramp. I think we have our invitation to ascend, the doctor concluded, waving a languid hand towards the vine. Romana looked a little less confident. It certainly looks a particularly easy climb. What if it is just as easy for the werebeasts? They didn't seem to have any issues with stairs. The doctor frowned. You may be right, of course, but we can only hope you're not. Perhaps they truly are inept when it comes to going up, much like cats coming down. In any event, even if they can climb the vine, we shall at least only have one avenue of approach to defend. Plus, we'll have the higher ground. Romana inclined her head. A sound point. A defensible position is not to be sniffed at. And so together they began to climb. Walk might have been a better description as they wound their way up the gently curling tendril. Onwards they went until they were level with the bulk of the canopies of the surrounding, more conventional trees. It was at this elevation that they met the lowest of the branches of the iron root. They decided to stop there in the bowl formed by the branch meeting the trunk. This actually created quite a substantial flat and partially walled area, almost like a small fort or watchtower. They were also totally hidden from the ground. I suppose we could just wait things out here until dawn. With any luck and with the sunrise, they might well disperse. As it is, they may never realize we're here at all and pass us by, Romana suggested. The doctor looked unconvinced. As if we're ever that lucky, he said a little wearily. Still, we can but try. The two Time Lords sat down to wait. Occasionally they would risk peeking over the side to watch for any signs of the werebeasts, but there were none. Indeed, the howls and grunts sounded as distant as before, even if distributed all around them. Eventually, however, the noises began to get louder. I fear we may pong a bit, the doctor noted. Romana looked a little put out. Well, we have been running quite a lot, the doctor chuckled. I fear even if we'd just showered, their augmented animal senses would have sniffed us out a mile away. As they peeked out again over the lip of their hideout, the first of their hunters burst into view. Even in the dim light beneath their tree, they could make out enough detail to know it was the werebear. It was joined moments later by the werefox and werewolf, plus at least three more creatures of a variety of origins, but all sharing similar builds and ferocity. The werefox had obviously recovered from his earlier beating and looked up at the tree, sniffing the air, clearly out for blood. It took a step or two towards the tree, aiming for the base of the vampire vine. It placed its right foot upon the tendril. Today was just not its lucky day. It screeched and leapt backwards, hopping on its left foot while clutching its right one in its forepaws. All the while it yelped as it hopped, in a great deal of ongoing pain. The iron root or the vampire vine at least, hurt the werebeast, Romana exclaimed. The doctor's head bobbed thoughtfully. So it would seem. Perhaps they are allergic? Or maybe all that fur builds up one heck of a charge, which are charcoal-like trees cheerfully and painfully removed? Whatever the mechanism, it seems for now we are safe. No longer bothering to hide, the two time lords leant on the edge of their makeshift balcony and continued to watch their ravenous wardens. Eventually, their thoughts were forced to return to how to escape this predicament. I suppose when the moon set, we might then be free to go. We must get back to Buddha to rejoin our Albion friends and continue our pursuit of Nugati, Romana insisted. The doctor raised a skeptical eyebrow. And how do you know this time of the month is not actually a time of a month? We have no idea if this is a one-night curse. Do they stay like this only at night? Do they remain this way for as long as the moons remain in conjunction? And how long exactly do they remain in conjunction? I'm afraid my knowledge of Hungarian astronomy is somewhat sketchy on the details. Romana shook her head. We must be able to think of something. This riddle must be solved. The doctor did not respond immediately. Then a smile slowly crept across his face. What has it got in its pockets? He mused to himself. What on Gallifrey are you talking about? Romana asked, bemused and a little impatient. The doctor continued to smile. Oh, nothing really. Just an old book you reminded me of. But in doing so, you also reminded me of my very newest of pockets. Or more precisely, my satchel. 
Shall we see what it's got in it? He suggested cheerfully. Together, they opened the satchel and started poring over its contents. Near the top, and quite obvious due to its bulk, was the black leather wallet Rongard had recovered from Dr. Nugati's room on board the A-36 spaceship. A fleeting shadow passed across Romana's face as she recognized it, but was quickly gone as more immediate concerns took priority. The doctor, however, took the wallet in his hand and stared at it for a long moment. Then he unrolled it along the top of the natural wooden wall they were leaning on and stared at the array of vials and syringes inside. Each contained their own unique, unhealthy colored ichor. He took out his sonic screwdriver and scanned them again. As I thought, he said to Romana, I think we have, at least in small samples, a complete set of ingredients for, well, whatever Nugati cares to make. I wonder if we might be able to whip up an antidote to the curse from those same ingredients which caused, or at least revived it in the first place. Romana frowned, seeing difficulties. Perhaps, but how would you even begin to know what you are looking for without a sample from one of the victims? The doctor grinned broadly. Ah, but Romana, you've already provided me with that. Romana looked questioningly at the other Time Lord. In response, he pulled up the cuff of his snazzy black suit jacket to reveal the cuff of his off-white shirt. He pointed to it proudly. On the cuff was a sizable, roughly circular bloodstain. Unlike the blood they had seen from the reanimated animals in the castle, or the ample blood from Nugati's manservant on the A-36, this blood looked more normally Albion, a much healthier red rather than purplish. You provided it, the doctor continued cheerfully, when you clubbed the werefox on the back of the head. Romana raised her eyebrows. Happy to be of service, she said a little wearily. Now the doctor set to work scanning his sample. He next returned his attention to Dr. Nugati's biological toolkit. Romana watched with increasing concern as he mixed first one colorful ooze with another, then more and more pairings, seemingly in random combinations. Combinations turned into combinations of combinations as the mixtures grew ever more distant from their points of origin. Finally, the doctor held two syringes aloft, one in each hand. Ta-da! he cried triumphantly. Romana gave a mute round of applause with the fingers of one hand upon the palm of the other. And this will reverse the curse? Romana asked dubiously. I haven't the faintest idea, the doctor responded confidently. Romana rolled her eyes. Then what on Gallifrey have you been doing? Now it was the doctor's turn to frown. Working, of course. I merely meant that without a trial there is no way to be certain this will work. But from my scans of the blood and the ingredients in the kit, this stands every chance of doing the job. Chance, eh? Lucky thirteen, Romana replied a little sarcastically. Pah! The doctor responded dismissively. Romana now looked over the edge of their hiding place at their potential patients below. I have to say this plan of yours seems very chancy indeed. There are at least half a dozen of those crazed, muscle-bound creatures down there. I appreciate that you made two syringes, but even the two of us together will have a tough time injecting all of them. Before we get bitten to death, I mean. Here the doctor's face became utterly serious and grim. No, Romana, I'm sorry, but this I have to do alone. Romana threw up her hands in exasperation. Doctor, don't be ridiculous. There is no way you can subdue half a dozen crazed beasts on your own, all while attempting to inject them. The doctor looked as though he was a little offended by this. He drew himself up to his full height. We are time lords, you and I and not to put too fine a point on it, exceptional among them. Romana raised a finger, not so much in objection to judge from her expression, more to raise a clarification or point of order. Now, hang on a minute. I graduated from the Gallifreyan Academy. Yes, 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 the doctor interrupted. I know you have better paper qualifications than I, but there is more to life than certificates. You cannot deny that, at a conservative estimate, 99.8% of humans, Albions, or indeed any non-Gallifreyan are less intellectually gifted than you or I. Romana's eyes went for yet another tumble. A questionable measure, but I fail to see its relevance even if true. You can't outthink the claws, talons, and bites of half a dozen juiced-up beowulf monsters. And perhaps more importantly, you still haven't made any sensible distinction between yourself and me. There is no good reason why I shouldn't be just as involved in your insane scheme as you are. 
A ghost of a smile played across the doctor's lips for a fraction of a second before his look of aloof determination returned. He continued as if her words had never been spoken. In addition, while our physical superiority may not be quite so marked, I am clearly physically superior to the majority of humans, Albions, or even Gallifreyans. Romana snorted. Now this I have to hear. I was the Venusian Aikido champion on Gallifrey. You were the only practitioner of the art on Gallifrey. Fine, the doctor snapped impatiently. I was in the top fifty even on Venus. Aren't there only about fifty Venusians on Venus? Romana asked innocently. My point is, the doctor continued through gritted teeth, that my physical endurance and combat prowess, augmented as it is by my unusual intelligence, unusual is certainly the word, Romana interjected, should not be underestimated. I stand head and shoulders above most standard humanoid beings. Finishing with his head held high, hands on his hips, he looked ready to take on the world, indeed any and all worlds. Need I remind you that I have acquired quite some prowess in the martial arts? Romana pointed out. Remember who brought you to the ground on Aquathi? And who has been watching your back repeatedly recently with my blade come club? You've still not made any reasonable distinction between your suitability for this task and mine. The doctor's head dropped and his tone became more sheepish. In any event, we need them to bite me. With that, he reversed the syringes in his hands and stabbed himself in both thighs. He emptied their contents into himself. Doctor, no! Romana cried as the realization hit her. She suddenly knew what his true plan had been all along. She made a lunge for him, but too slow. He leapt the natural wall surrounding their hidey hole and began to pelt full speed down the twisting tendril of the vampire vine. Romana watched open-mouthed, stunned and positively distraught as he ran lower and lower, ever closer to the huddled were-creatures who eagerly and hungrily awaited his approach. Before he even reached ground level, the doctor threw himself through the air to land on the werebear, sending them both sprawling to the floor. Then the doctor disappeared from view beneath the seething mass of snapping, tearing creatures. Romana finally recovered her wits and pelted down the vampire vine to do whatever she could, do or die in the attempt. As she spiraled down, almost as if riding some strange arboreal helter-skelter, she began to notice odd things occurring in the melee below. First, one creature fell backwards from the fray to lie on its back, twitching spasmodically. Then a second. Both had blood upon their fangs. They had clearly caused someone some damage. Romana redoubled her efforts to reach the ground and rescue her friend, whatever was left of him. She rounded the final corner and suddenly slowed. Her feet finally left the vine and touched the forest floor itself, at which point she came to a complete standstill. Six werebeasts lay upon the mossy clearing, each apparently writhing in agony, either with their backs arched, bellies thrusting skywards, or doubled over in fetal positions as if their stomachs were on fire. In the center of all this carnage and mayhem lay the body of the doctor, deathly still. There were several tears in his trousers and jacket. Everywhere there were bloody bite marks and pieces of missing flesh. There was even one unpleasant toothy gash on his right cheek. Romana walked towards him, ignoring the writhing were-creatures all around, her only concern being to reach her friend, to discover if he was alive or dead. She reached a quivering hand towards him, her eyes having gained an uncharacteristic shine. Suddenly the doctor was on his feet. He raised his arms over his head, hands almost claw-like as they grasped at the sky. There was a slight impression that he had grown, his clothes looking a little too tight for him. Was he beginning to grow a beard? Look upon me, beings, and tremble, the doctor roared to anyone within earshot, which at his current volume probably included half the forest. I am the lonely god. I am unbound. I am unequaled. At this point, Romana slapped him hard across the face. Oh, I wasn't talking about you, he said perfectly normally, looking a little surprised. Obviously, you're my equal, more or less. Romana shook her head. More or less, eh? And that was not why I slapped you. We are neither of us gods. Just ask the next bulk denizen we run into. Granted, none of the lesser species, humans, Albions, Daleks, Levithians, the list is endless, could possibly identify with us. Their linear and limited existences, senses and perceptions of reality obviously preclude that. But while we see and comprehend things most of them could never imagine, we do still share some of their weaknesses and flaws. Aspects of ungodliness. We are none of us perfect after all. But I didn't slap you because you left me. 
and every other Gallifreyan out of your rant. I slapped you because you had turned into a raving lunatic and were beginning to look a little wary. How are you feeling now? Along with the calming of the doctor's mental state, the strange bulging seemed to have also subsided. Even the extra facial hair seemed to have molted away. In addition, his bites seemed to have stolen a march in the healing process to boot. Just a few side effects of the cure I concocted. Obviously it was not meant for a healthy Gallifreyan, but my physiology got the better of it in the end, with a little encouragement from you. Romana nodded twice, accepting both his explanation and his assessment of his health. Then she slapped him hard across the face again. Ow! He said, reeling slightly, his own hand rushing up to rub his doubly punished cheek. What was that for? He asked incredulously. That, Romana said pointedly, was for risking your life so foolishly, and for not including me in your plan, or the risk. You are not here to speak for me, act for me, or decide for me, and you are not to go throwing your life away on my account. Well, I appreciate your concern, he said a little defiantly but I am still here. Romana gave him a hard stare. The doctor stared back, puzzled. I didn't mean to worry you, he said simply, and a little more softly. You might have regenerated, Romana said seriously, or worse still, you might not. How many regenerations do you really have? How many have you really used? The doctor attempted to brush her concerns away. Well, how many regenerations do you have left? Romana smiled slyly caught up in the doctor's distraction in spite of herself. Oh, I still have a couple to spare, at least enough to enjoy my retirement. As she said this final word, laden with irony, she gesticulated around them at the twitching, bloodied forms of Dr. Nugati's residential staff. Then the smile vanished, and the frown returned. Now return the favor and answer my question. The doctor looked uncomfortable with the interrogation. Oh, you know, plenty. Gallifrey topped the tank right up to full again. I'm sure. Romana shook her head far from convinced. Gallifrey tends to be very sparing with its extra regeneration energy. Not like the Sisterhood of Khan, very fast and loose with their magic potions and regeneration anabolic steroids. But Gallifrey is not so free and easy. What if the Sisterhood of Khan's shot in the arm wasn't a regeneration at all? Just some way of stretching your eighth doctor with a few facial strains along the way? More of a face drop, if you like. No war doctor at all, really. What if your past vanity regeneration wasn't a true regeneration either? What if on Trenzalore, Gallifrey just put on a light show to keep you indebted to them, giving you nothing but a special effect? What if you really were the Twelfth Doctor all along, and after you were shot by the Cybermen you really did become the thirteenth and final of your line, all twelve regenerations finally spent? No. How many do you really have left now? Ten? Five? Three? Two? Not even that, perhaps. Yes, I worry about you. The doctor rubbed his face thoughtfully and winced at the renewed pain. Then he gave Romana a twisted little smile. Honestly, I didn't know you cared, he said brightly. Romana shook her head wearily. Of course I care, just like you. The doctor frowned and looked flustered. Well, perhaps, possibly, I might care. Just a tiny bit. Romana continued to shake her head and gave a tired smile. As I said, just like you, just a tiny bit. The two Time Lords looked around at the slowly waking figures of Akosh, steward of Visegrad Castle, and the other servants. All were now completely returned to normal Albion or Hungarian appearance. With any luck, the Doctor and Romana thought to themselves, they should be able to wangle a lift back to Buda Aerodrome. <laughs>
Masters, mistresses, the doctor requires materials in order to maintain the TARDIS and ensure continued functionality. He similarly requires carbon-based comestibles to sustain his own biological functions and existence. Master would never say this, but he requires aid beyond that supplied by this unit in order to acquire these. To aid the doctor in his various tasks and creations, this can be most effectively achieved via Patreon or Substack subscriptions, or through donations directly to PayPal, or if you desire physical goods in return for your contributions, written accounts of my travels with the doctor are also available on Amazon. Links are in the description below. Thank you. Masters, mistresses.